and uh, welcome to Smoky Row. I'm Nick Rule, a local school board representative here in Oskaloosa, and I have the pleasure of uh, welcoming a special guest here uh, today. Today our country is in trying times, and we have an economy that continues to flounder, and budgets that are tight for our schools, for our friends, and for our families. Now more than ever, we need ideas, and a leader that will be able to stand on the stage with the president in front of the nation in a debate to effectively communicate that America just may not be on the right track. Our guest today has done this before with the contract with America during the Clinton years. Under his leadership during that time, Congress passed the first balanced budget in over a generation. Getting Congress to do that today in Washington would be tough. But Newt has done it before and he could do it again. So as a young professional, I am concerned that this nation's future may not be on the right path, but I am optimistic. And our guest today has done it again and he can bring us back. So without further ado, let's give a warm Oskaloosa welcome to candidate for the GOP nomination for president, Speaker Newt Gingrich. say thank you all for coming out. This is really very, very impressive. Plus and I are delighted. We both want to start by wishing each and every one of you a Merry Christmas. Uh, we hope uh, this season turns out to be very joyful for you. Uh, let me start where, where Nick was and ask a couple questions. How many of you agree that America is significantly on the wrong track? Just raise your hand if you agree, okay? Uh, how many of you agree that even if we win the election, the people who have us on the wrong track will fight very hard to stop us from changing. Okay. This is really important, okay? I mean, if you want to understand why I'm running and, and why I think that my participation is different, can you hear this? Is this working all right out there? Do I have to keep it pretty close? Okay. It, I decided to run because I think the scale of change we need to get America back on the right track so that younger Americans have a real chance to have the kind of future that our parents and grandparents gave us. That this is a really hard job. And I think it requires three things. It requires solutions big enough to really make a difference. Not just the normal political baloney, but really profound change. Getting back to a balanced budget. Implementing the 10th Amendment to return power back home. Cutting taxes and cutting regulations to go back to job creation. Creating an American energy plan so we don't rely on the Middle East. And by the way, it was announced today that this is the highest annual price on average for gasoline in American history. And that's a side product of Obama's anti-American energy plan. And high gasoline prices affect every American family. They affect the economy. They raise the cost of living, and in rural and small town America, it is particularly destructive to have expensive gasoline. In addition, so, so part one is, you gotta have solutions big enough to be real. And if you go to my first name, to newt.org, you'll see a proposed 21st century contract with America, which meets that requirement. The second thing you have to have is somebody who knows what they're doing. I, I did, with all due respect to my friends who are running, we've tried an amateur, and it had been a very good experience. The fact is, Obama doesn't know what he's doing, and he proves it almost every day. And so, let's look at the background. I helped twice to create a national majority, 1980 with Reagan, 1994 with the Congress. I helped pass the first spending cut that was a real cut, not, not a decline in the rate of increase, a real cut, the first domestic discretionary spending cut since World War II was 1981 with Reagan. I helped pass the second real dis discretionary spending cut since World War II in 1995 as Speaker. Under Reagan, we helped pass an economic growth plan that had less taxes, less regulation, more American energy, and respect for the people who create jobs. What was the result? Unemployment went from 10.6% and dropped to about 5.6%. Millions of Americans went back to work. In one month, August, 
1983, we created a million 300,000 jobs in just one month. What happened when I became a speaker? We implemented a plan, exactly like Reagan. Lower taxes, less regulation, more American energy, respect for people who create jobs. What was the result? In the four years I was speaker, the American people created 11 million new jobs, and unemployment dropped to 4.2%. In terms of practical experience, I helped pass the first entitlement reform in your lifetime, welfare, two out of three people went back to work or went to school. I helped pass the first tax cut in 16 years and the largest capital gains tax cut in history, which is why the economy got better. Out of, as a result of all that, we balanced the federal budget for four straight years. Nobody in your lifetime has balanced the federal budget for four straight years, except for we did. Finally, as the North Korean events have reminded us, the world is dangerous. I am the only candidate in the race who for 23 years taught one and two star generals and admirals. I'm the only candidate in the race who served on the Defense Policy Board. And my background in national security areas, I think, is in a totally different league. And these are good, for, none of these people are bad people. But the fact is they don't have the experience at the national level, and they don't have experience in national security. Now, I have one last big point I want to make, and then I'm really going to turn to you and take questions. But I want you to know that, how many of you have noticed that there have been some negative ads? <laughs> how many of you also noticed that there have been negative mailings? How many of you have gotten negative phone calls? Okay. Well, I, I just have a single word for all that. Baloney. Amen. What I think they're doing is they're, they're showing the people of Iowa that you only have two choices in this race. You have somebody who in the debate stayed positive, somebody whose advertising is positive, somebody whose speeches are issue-oriented, and you have a group of normal, everyday politics as usual, hire a consultant, write a negative ad, go raise the money, and see if you can smear your opponent out of the race. Well, I want you to know two things. First, I am not going to change. They can't hit me with enough negative ads to make me go negative, because I think it's bad for America. The only person who profits from Republican negative ads is Barack Obama. I'm going to challenge my friends to take the negative ads off the air. Amen. I had a very direct press conference a little while ago, and I challenged Governor Romney, who was on Morning Joe on MSNBC, and said, well, he didn't really like it, but he had no control of it. <coughs> now, his, his super PAC is run by his former staff with money given by his friends. And I would simply suggest to all of you, if he can't influence his former staff and his friends, how is he going to influence the Congress? How is he going to influence the Russians or the Chinese? This is just silly. So either he wants a campaign of negative attack ads, or he's going to get them off the air. They, they, I'm told they bought a million four hundred thousand dollars next week for negative ads. That's more than we'll spend in the whole campaign in terms of Iowa. That's just for the super PACs negative ads. And my challenge to Governor Romney is simple. Either you stand behind those ads and you tell people that you're proud of being negative, or you get them off the air. I don't care if they spend a million four hundred thousand dollars in positive ads, because I don't think they do him all that much good. But I think a million four hundred thousand dollars in negative ads is really, frankly, disgusting. And I'm going to take that head on. me two favors if you really want a positive campaign. If you see any of these candidates, ask them to take the negative ads off the air and cut out the negative mailings and the negative phone calls. Just walk up to them, look them in the eye and say, this isn't good for America. This is exactly why people are sick of Washington. Second, if you go to the caucus, and I hope you will, and if you're for me, and I hope you will be, before the voting, remind everybody at that caucus 
They have a chance to break out of politics as usual and vote for the one person who's been positive for the whole campaign, or they have a chance to continue politics as usual by giving their vote to people who clearly are in the old school, doing the old thing in the old way. We are not going to change America with negative ads. Now, people said to me, well, but how are you going to deal with Barack Obama? You don't have to be negative about Barack Obama. All you have to do is tell the truth. <laughs> when, Harry, when Harry Truman was running for re-election in 1948, his supporters would yell out to him, give him hell, Harry. And he would say, I don't need to give them hell. I just tell the truth and it feels like hell. <laughs> I mean, this is the greatest food stamp president in American history. Now, that's a fact. This president has done more to raise the price of gas than any president in history. He closed down a major American field and didn't allow any new development. He, he has fo fo followed policies that are anti-energy, including the pipeline. I mean, there's this continuous policy. So if I say, you know, if you want a high price of gasoline while you go get your food stamps, you've got a great president. <coughs> that's not being negative. That's accurately telling you about Barack Obama. So, I need your help. Two last things I'll say. I'm not going to ask a single person here to be for me. Because if you're for me, you'll vote, go home, and say, I sure hope Newt fixes it. And this is too big a job. We need to all be engaged. I will ask you to be with me for the next eight years, shoulder to shoulder with Callista and me, bringing pressure to bear on the Congress, on the governor, on the state legislature, on the city and county, on the school board, because we need as a team to make it happen. We also need to be a team because we're going to make mistakes. And when we make mistakes, I want you to tell us, or if the world changes, or if you come up with a better idea. 537 elected officials in Washington won't save the country. 305 million Americans will. Lastly, I want you to be with me because if we shrink government in Washington by applying the 10th Amendment, we have to grow citizens back home to fill the vacuum. So this is a very serious opportunity. Because the choices are so big, because over here you have food stamps, and over here you have paychecks. Over here you have redistribution. Over here you have work. Over here you have somebody who believes in bureaucratic socialism. Over here you have somebody who believes in free enterprise. Over here you have somebody who believes in a European style government where you're a subject and the bureaucrats are in charge. Over here you have somebody who believes in American exceptionalism where you are endowed by your creator, you are sovereign and you loan power to the government. Because the gap is so wide, I will challenge the president to seven three hour debates in the Lincoln Douglas tradition of a timekeeper, but no moderator. Now, I will tell you that I'm going to concede in advance that he can use a teleprompter. <laughs> After all, if you were going to try to defend Obamacare, wouldn't you want to be able to use a teleprompter? I believe that he will agree to debate. People think that I'm too optimistic, but I'll tell you what. Three reasons. Number one, he announced in Springfield in February of 2007, quoting Lincoln. Number two, just pure ego. This is a guy who graduated from Columbia University. He graduated from Harvard Law School. He was the editor of the Harvard Law Review. He is the best orator in the Democratic Party. How does he look in a mirror and say he's afraid to debate a guy who taught at West Georgia College? I just don't think he'll do it. But there's a last practical reason. As, as many of you know, I study history. And in particular, unlike the president, I study American history. Yes. <laughs> if you go back to 1858, what you discover is when Lincoln announced he'd been out of office for 10 years, He'd served one two-year term as a congressman. He'd served a couple terms in the state legislature. And he said, I'm running for the Senate. And he challenged Senator Douglas 
He said, there are 105 days left, let's debate every day. Douglas, who was the best known senator in the country and who was uh, assumed to be the next president, said, I don't think I want to debate you. So everywhere Douglas went, Lincoln would go the next day and he would answer his speech. And pretty soon Douglas began to figure out the news media was printing Lincoln's rebuttal more than they were printing Douglas' speech. So he wrote Lincoln, he said, all right, I'll be to debate you. There were nine congressional districts in Illinois. He said, you've already been in two of them chasing me. I'm not going to go back there, but I'll debate you in the other seven. That's how they got to the number seven. The debates became so important. I think they're the most important explanation of the Constitution and of freedom since the Federalist Papers. They were printed in virtually every newspaper in the country. They were reprinted as a book the next year. They were a major part of why Lincoln became the president. So here's my guarantee to you. If you will help me at the caucus, if I become the nominee, when I'm in Tampa accepting the nomination, if the president has not yet agreed to the debates, I will announce in my acceptance speech that from that point on, the White House will be my scheduler and wherever the president goes, I will show up four hours later to answer his speech. In the age of talk radio and 24-hour cable news, I think one or two weeks of Gingrich answering Obama, and he'll decide that the debates are less painful. So that's my theory of how we're going to do this. Let me, uh, if you want to throw it open to questions for a few minutes, I'm, I'm delighted. Uh, if some, yes, sir. The question is, we're going to shrink the size of government. How, how, where will that start, and how far-reaching will it be? Well, first of all, because I want us to run as a team next year, as we did in 1980 and we did in 1994, I'm hoping that everybody who runs on the ticket will be part of the same 21st century contract with America, and. I will ask the Congress to stay in session when they're sworn in on January 3rd. And I will ask them between January 3rd and the presidential inaugural to repeal Obamacare, Dodd-Frank, <coughs> and Sarbanes-Oxley as a starting point. I will then ask them, I will then on, on uh, the uh, day I'm sworn in, after about two or three hours after the inaugural address, I will sign between 100 and 200 executive orders, all of which will be published by October 1st. The very first executive order will abolish all of the White House czars as of that day. And move it back to the I agree strongly with the strong America Now people. Uh, I believe if you would apply Lean Six Sigma to the federal government, you would save at least $500 billion a year. I just talked to, to a guy a few minutes ago who has finished a contracting job for the federal government over a year ago and has still not been paid. Now, in the private sector, that would be impossible. And yet, that's typical of the inefficiency. I, I always tell people, one of the reasons I'm an optimist is that there's a world that works and there's a world that fails. Now, I'll give you an example. How many of you have ever gone online to track a package at UPS or FedEx? Have you ever done this? Okay, so this is not a theory, right? This actually happens. I say that because in Washington they'll say, well, Gingrich has all these, you know, I think the phrase was zany ideas. So tracking packages for free in real time is not zany, okay? So think about it. Those two companies track 24 million packages a day while they're moving. That's the world that works. Now over here is the federal government, which currently cannot find 11 million illegal aliens while they're sitting still. <laughs> so one of my policy proposals is, let's ship a package to every person who's here illegally, and when they get the package, we pull it up on the computer, we know exactly where they are. Get, 
rid of Obamacare, wouldn't that also get rid of the part of it that gets rid of the Medicare donut hole? That donut hole is making my brother near bankruptcy. Uh, every year it becomes a real financial hardship. Closing that donut hole would help a lot of retired people. Right. Do you get rid of that? There are three or four pieces out of a 2,700 page bill. There are about 300 pages that are pretty useful. And what I would do is urge the, the total repeal of Obamacare with a six month window to allow the Congress to pass the parts that ought to be kept. I mean, for example, I'm for health information technology. I think it's going to save a tremendous number of lives and billions of dollars. I am for no preconditions once you're in the insurance system. I mean, I think once you get in, you know, you're part of the insurance pool, you should, uh, you can't offer it to people who aren't already in the system, because then everybody would stay out till they got sick. But if you're already in the system, nobody should be dropped out of the system once they're in it. So there, there are pieces, but that's 300 pages out of 2,700. And that, so that's how I'd approach it. Okay. Yes, sir. It seems like to me that if we're going to get a lot of these old reports complete, we're going to need to pull Congress's feet to the fire. And I was just thinking, you know, there are three things that I, you know, I feel we need to do. I was wanting to know what your thoughts were. The first thing, I think we need term limits on Congress. Second thing, I, need to, I think we need to ban members of Congress from being lobbyists for life after they've been defeated in the election. And the third thing is, what do you think about amending the Constitution to say, by no means is the Congress required to balance the budget. However, in any fiscal year where they don't, no member of Congress is allowed to receive any pay. <laughs> <laughs> One term limits two, how do you have lobby, my con former congressman, and three, uh, attaching a fiscal responsibility that you pay for the difference, or you'll get paid that year. Uh, let me work backwards. There are cities that, that act in states that, because of the Depression era, that actually have the requirement if you run a deficit, you are personally responsible. And it's amazing how careful they are to not run a deficit. <laughs> so there, there's an interesting thought there that's worth pursuing, I think. Uh, I think you can have a lifetime ban on lobbying. I, I don't think that's actually a major, a major difficulty. The, the first one I have more concern with. The places where, I, I was more in favor of term limits 10 years ago. The places where we've tried it, like California, what's happened is the only people who are new are the members of the legislature. So you have all the old bureaucrats and all the old lobbyists, and the legislators have no control because they don't know what's going on. And so I, I would rather go, to, I'd rather go to a different model. I'd rather say, let's change all the election law, get rid of all the super PACs, allow people to donate any amount they want of their personal after-tax income, as long as they report it every evening on the internet, so you know who's giving to who. And the result would be the challengers could raise the money and you would see a lot of incumbents defeated every two years. But you, you need to make it possible for the challenger to raise enough money to be competitive with the incumbent. And right now the system is rigged so the incumbents have a very, very big...